Today we're going to be continuing our discussion of classification, but rather than talking about any specific algorithm, we're going to talk about the broader process of doing classification, how do you get your data and features in a form that you can use to successfully do classification. And remember that every time we talk about classification, we're talking about applying classification to some data set based on the rules the knowledge that we extract from some other data set. And if you want to do that successfully, your data need to look good and you need to be able to extract features that describe your data well. So today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how you get good labels and how do you know if you've gotten good labels. And we'll also talk about the process of going through a classification experiment on three specific examples of doing classification and iteratively building features that do a better job of capturing what's going on in those data sets. And we'll also talk about some of the best practices about how you can split your data to make sure that you're doing a good job at knowing whether your classifier is working correctly. In a class like this, you often get data handed to you by me. And when you go out into the real world, you don't get this. You have to find your data somehow. And sometimes your data don't have labels that you can use directly. And when they don't have labels, you need to add labels to them. This is a process called annotation. And doing this correctly is really difficult. People spend their entire careers building up annotation cohorts, people who do annotation, and building up annotation software, software that lets you do annotation, and stake their entire careers and reputations on being able to do this well. Because machine learning, data science, natural language processing, they all depend on having annotated data from which we can extract a supervised learning signal. There are many kinds of things that we can think about as annotation. Some of this is natural, something that happens for free. So for example, if you get an email and then you say, oh, this is spam, don't show things to me like this in the future, that's a way that you can get free annotation from a user of, say, your email service. And that's great. Sometimes you want to capture a deeper linguistic insight. So, for example, looking at the word break, does it match one of four dictionary definitions of the word break? And you really need an expert to annotate this correctly. Other times you need experts in a different domain. So, for example, let's say that you want to build an automatic system to do e-discovery. So in a lawsuit, a bunch of people uh, come to the lawyer's table and one side says, we need your documents. The other side says, well, we're only going to turn over documents that are relevant to the case. And the process of adjudicating whether a document is relevant or not depends on lawyers. So you need to hire very expensive lawyers to decide whether a document is relevant or not. This, again, is annotation. And this is what you use to train a classifier. And the big companies like Google and Facebook recognize that annotation is really important. So, for example, you have probably seen Google asking you, uh, click on the squares in this image where there's a vehicle. That is a form of annotation, and big computer companies are getting you to provide annotation for free to prove that you are a human. There are many reasons why we annotate data, not just to train classifiers. We may want to understand what's going on in a data set. So we have a bunch of news articles. How many of them are about a hurricane? How many of them have a liberal slant or a Republican slant? We may want to not just build systems that do some tasks, but understand how well humans can do this task. So for example, if we're building a machine translation system, we may want to have humans translate sentences as well so that we can know how well do humans translate these sentences. And maybe we'll have different levels of uh, translators do the same task so that you know what a novice translator can do versus an expert translator who's been doing it for 50 years. Okay, so how do you do annotation? Typically what you do is you hire some people to do annotation. This can be people at your university, at your company, or you can hire crowd workers from the internet to look at your data and assign labels to your data. Then, once you have that first pass, you'll look at the data and see what happened. Oftentimes, what you'll need to do is you'll need to revise the labels that you put in. You'll discover that, oh, almost everything is related to politics. We need to subdivide politics into finer-grained categories. 
or people get really confused between healthcare and medicine. We need to combine those into a single label. So oftentimes the label set that you come up with in the first round isn't exactly the label set that you will do moving forward. Once you've refined your label set, then the next thing that you'll do is you'll take data that has been annotated once and annotated again by different people. This is to make sure that people agree on the labels that they're assigning to the data. If humans cannot agree on the label that should be assigned to a single piece of data, it's impossible for a machine to do the same thing. And as you find disagreements, what you'll need to do is you'll need to either go back to step one or find your labels. You'll need to perhaps hire different people. Maybe the, the people doing the job aren't so good at the job. Or maybe you'll need to change the entire task that you're doing to focus on, on a different aspect of the data. Let's talk a little bit more about the people doing your annotation. You can hire people at your organization, whether that's a university or a company. These people will likely be nearby you and will be easy to talk to if there are any problems. But they're often likely more expensive than if you explored other options. Another downside is that they are very much like you, and if they're a part of your same university or same organization, they will likely have a similar background to you, and they'll likely also have similar biases and knowledge to you. And this may be good in that it requires less effort for you to train them, but it could also be bad if they have some sort of bias or inherent assumptions about the world that may not be true universally. Another approach that allows you to have a larger pool of annotators and perhaps do it more quickly is to use people on the internet. There are a variety of platforms that let you do this. Amazon Mechanical Turk, Crowdflower, Upwork, all of these are known as crowdsourcing platforms that let you put data on the web and get people to annotate your data. And each of these platforms have different pluses and minuses. I personally like Crowdflower a lot because it cares first and foremost about inter-annotator agreement, what we talked about previously, making sure that different annotators looking at the same data get consistent answers. But the downside of this, because these are anonymous people on the web, is often you have people doing this task that are not necessarily putting forth a good faith effort. They're trying to get money without doing the task well. These are often called scammers, and whenever you put your task out on the web, you need to have some sort of mechanism to prevent people from cheating. But the people who do these crowdsourcing tasks have really interesting backgrounds. You can find people who speak many different languages, and they're doing these crowdsourcing tasks for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're stuck at home and they're trying to find something interesting to fill their time with. So you can get a lot of different people with diverse backgrounds to do these tasks. And sometimes you can get annotation for free. If you're running some sort of web service, if you have a task that's related to the web service that you're providing, you often get annotations for free. A great example of this is spam email. If people are using your email client, they're telling you when something is spam or not, and you can use that as free annotation. Similarly, if people are organizing their blogs in different categories, you can use that as free annotation. Or if people are applying metadata to their posts on social media, you can use that as annotation as well. So for example, people are putting locations or people tagged to specific posts. That being said, these data are often very noisy because these are not trained users, you're not doing any sort of inter-annotator agreement, and these data will likely be much lower quality. The flip side to that is that these data are often much easier and cheaper to obtain, and so maybe just more data wins out in the end. Think about what would happen if you provided an inconsistent data set to an algorithm. That is, you have the same data point with conflicting labels. Once it appears that this data point is not spam, once it appears this data point is spam. Exactly the same document, conflicting labels. So one very clear way of seeing what would happen is thinking about a support vector machine. If you have the same data point with diverging labels, there will be no separating hyperplane between the two classes because the two classes are touching in a single data point, and thus your algorithm will not work. And if this happens a lot of the time, even if you do things like a Slack SVM, you're going to have a lot of problematic data points, and your algorithm won't work as well. 
And this is something that I really stress in these classes, because even though we don't spend a lot of time on annotation, once you get out into the real world, this is often a problem that you run into. And what makes it even worse is that it's often a problem that's undetected. So people are so anxious to get any data at all, and anxious to get as much data as possible, that they only label each data point once, and they don't compute agreement whether people are assigning the same label to data points. And as a result, you may think, oh, I have this gigantic data set, I can now use it for data science. But what's actually happening is you have a lot of disagreement. You have people labeling things in different ways, and you don't actually have a consistent data set. And so the techniques that we talk about from machine learning and data science simply do not work because you don't have an effective data set. And what happens next is that you run this, and the data collection process was so expensive, the data annotation process took so long, that you then blame the thing that you did last, running your algorithm. And logistic regression doesn't work, support vector machines doesn't work, and you then decide we shouldn't be doing this fancy pants data science stuff at all, we should just go back to whatever we were doing before. So, for example, having people annotate this manually. And you don't question the assumptions that your data are useful. And that is often the problem. You didn't have a consistent classification scheme to start with. And I've done consulting for a lot of companies where they bring me in to try out some really sophisticated algorithm because they've tried all of the things that they could think of, and the problem was not the algorithm, it was the data itself. So as you're doing annotation, there's a lot of software that can help you. So I already talked about some of the crowdsourcing platforms that you can use, like Crowdflower, that can help you do annotation. If you want to do it locally, and if your annotation needs are a little bit more complex, there are a lot of different annotation platforms that people have developed to help you do annotation effectively and to measure things like inner annotator agreement. So don't try to reinvent the wheel. So the important thing here is that you need to check how you're doing throughout the annotation process. You need to create a data set that is then useful. But, how do you then know whether your algorithm is developing well? And what do you do if you cannot extract features well? That's what I want to talk about next before we get into our case studies of actually doing feature engineering on a data set where you have labels that you can trust. One thing that you need to do is you need to divide your data into a training set and a testing set. And the testing set should only be used a small number of times, preferably only once, because that's how it works in the real world. Once you build a spam classifier, you only get one chance to detect whether an email comes in as spam or not, and you need to get it right on your first try. Otherwise, the user is going to be upset. But, once you have this testing set, how do you do things like trying out different features without cheating? Because if you look at your test set more than once, a little bit of the information from the test set can seep into what you're doing, and thus you'll get an overall lower score when you then deploy it in the real world. One way that people use to check how well they're doing as they're de developing features or trying out different types of algorithms is doing cross-validation. In cross-validation, you're going to use different parts of your data as your test set. And you're basically going to sweep through your data and use every part of your data as a test set, and use every other part of your data as a training set. And so this is a way for every data point to be a part of some testing set. This requires more time than having discrete training and testing sets, but uh, this allows you to use your data to go a little bit further, and it's very common in data science. That being said, you should always have a real test set held out that you only use preferably once. However, uh, people often talk about a test set as they're developing their algorithms. And I prefer to use the term development set because you're using that during the development, and we should try to keep this notion of the test set special, that the test set is only used once. And so I prefer, unlike uh, this image that I stole, uh, to think about cross-validation as a development set, 
technique rather than a test set technique, even though it says test set right there. So, even though cross-validation is very important, sometimes it is not the technique that you should be using if there is some ordering effect to your data. So, for example, if things are changing over time, if what it means to be a spam email is changing over time, and you're doing cross-validation, you may cheat by looking into the future to figure out what's going on today. And that isn't realistic either. So, if there is ordering effects, you need to make sure that your development set and your test set are ordered temporally. Before we dive into the examples, the other thing that I want to talk about is what if it's hard for you to find features. So I'm going to talk about feature engineering that's assuming that you can build your features somehow. If you don't have a good signal for the final thing that you want to predict, you have to resort to unsupervised learning, so trying to get an algorithm to find patterns in your data. And we'll talk about this, examples of clustering and topic modeling, a little bit later in the course. But if you do have a clear signal, oftentimes you can use deep learning to try to find features automatically. This only works if you have a lot of data and you have a very clear signal about what the system should do in a particular example. But, if you do have that information, you can often use deep learning to develop and induce these features automatically. We'll also be talking about this in this course. The problem with both of these techniques is that it's often very difficult to understand what the algorithm is doing or whether it's doing a good job of discovering features that make sense. Whereas if you make the features yourself, you can understand what you're doing, hopefully. That said, both unsupervised learning and deep learning are quite popular, so we'll definitely talk about them in the course, but feature engineering should be a part of your tool set. It allows you to understand the data, and oftentimes this is the kind of information that you want to use if you're going to deploy this in a business. Deep learning or unsupervised learning can be difficult to predict what they'll do in the future, and if you're making the rules yourself, even if they get fed into a supervised machine learning algorithm, this gives you a better understanding of what's going to happen and gives you a little bit more control. In some cases, this is what you want. And in other cases, like if you have a smaller data set, this is exactly what you need to do because these approaches, unsupervised learning and deep learning, won't work on your smaller data set. So oftentimes, if you have a gigantic data set, you need to do feature engineering to even get a handle on your data.